Welcome to Terror at Collinwood. Today's episode features a conversation with legendary Emmy Award-winning makeup artist Todd McIntosh. But before we get to the show, I want to let you know that you can now help the podcast at buymeacoffee.com forward slash terror at Collinwood, all one word, which I've renamed Buy Me a Coffin. And people have asked me about uh, Patreon and donations. I have not started a Patreon account. I might. I have not crossed that bridge yet. But uh, in response to several people who've asked about ways to help the podcast, I have started an account. It's called buymeacoffee.com com forward slash terror at Collinwood. I will put a link to that in the show notes. You can donate to the podcast that way. That does help to defer the costs of web hosting for the podcast and also for the editing software. So no pressure, but if you'd like to show your support for the podcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash terror at Collinwood. And now let's get to the show. <laughs> Just a quick news bit here related to the discussion in this episode. We talked a lot about uh, Dick Smith and Dark Shadows, but this is actually part of a month-long event that celebrates the work of Dick Smith through screenings of several of the films that he worked on. This is already past, but we had Rick Baker doing an introduction for The Exorcist, Craig Reardon doing an introduction for Altered States, they had Scanners. Uh, they're also going to be showing Amadeus with an uh, uh, introduction by makeup artist Gerald Quist. So our discussion today is focused on Dick Smith's work on House of Dark Shadows and on the TV series uh, with the wonderful Todd McIntosh who's going to be doing the introduction for House of Dark Shadows on August 17th, 2023. With that in mind, there's also going to be a uh, informal meetup in Los Angeles prior to the screening of House of Dark Shadows on Thursday, August 17th at 5 p.m. Mary O'Leary posted this. Uh, she's going to be hosting a free informal event at the Academy Museum before the screening of House of Dark Shadows, you can email jonathanfrid.org at gmail.com for details. Be careful, my friend, where you tread, for I warn you now, there are spoilers ahead. Welcome to Terror at Collinwood. I am your hostess, Danielle, aka Penny Dreadful, and I am honored beyond honored to have my guest here today, Todd McIntosh. Todd is an Emmy Award-winning industry veteran makeup artist with over 40 years of active experience. His incredible work has been seen in TV shows and films such as Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Pushing Daisies, Masters of the Universe, Dracula Dead and Loving It, Doctor Strange, the 2004 WB Dark Shadows pilot, and so many more. Todd's interest in makeup was sparked when he first watched Dark Shadows at the age of seven. On August 17th, 2023, the Ted Mann Theater in Los Angeles will be presenting a vampire double bill featuring The Hunger and House of Dark Shadows. Todd will be introducing House of Dark Shadows and talking about Dick Smith's Dark Shadows makeup appliance work. Welcome to the show, Todd. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Oh, my goodness. Well, I want to thank uh, our mutual friend, Steve Schutt, for uh, connecting us here because uh, I he had mentioned to me that you were going to be introducing House of Dark Shadows. And um, I said, well, I want to I want to reach out to Todd at some point and have him on the show. But I, I was like, oh, he's probably probably too busy. And it's kind of short notice. But I'm so happy we were able to make this happen because it's so exciting to have you here. <laughs> well, as it turns out, I retired about six months before the writer's strike. Oh, yeah. So I just escaped. <laughs> <laughs> you got out, got out just in time. Got out just in time. So I have plenty of time to talk. 
before all, oh, wonderful, wonderful, fantastic. We're going to be talking about some some really fun things today. People are going to really love hearing from you uh, about your many experiences uh, in the industry. Um, but before we get to some of that, I want to hear about your childhood and how Dark Shadows uh, was uh, factored into that and how it was an inspiration. Because I always love hearing from people who've done such amazing things in the entertainment industry. And it turns out that they were Dark Shadows fans as kids. And I've heard that from several people in interviews and uh, and Dark Shadows is part of their childhood and inspired them creatively. Could you So could you talk a little bit about that? It's a big topic. Oh, go for it. Take as long uh, as you want. <laughs> dark shadows. In in the reference to what you're saying, how it inspired creativity in so many people who went on into the industry and went on to do creative things that are sort of based loosely on their love of dark shadows, is it's reflected in dark shadows itself. Right, the entire um, Phoenix storyline, the writers tell in interviews, was intended to be a sort of uh, child custody story that was very popular on soap operas at that time. And it was allowed to become this supernatural battle over the child. And obviously, as you know, the ratings went up on the show as soon as that hit the air. And I think there is something inherently creative, a hook that happened when that was done when that blooming of let's take something that's an ordinary thing like a custody battle and turn it into a supernatural thing that sparked the imagination of an entire generation of young people. I mean, I do know older people who were also watching the show at the time and I do see a bit of a thread there as well. Those of us who were outsiders, those of us who were not you know, part of the sports world or part of whatever, we're kind of lost for something to focus on. And my dear friend Peggy, who was 20 years older than me, was going through a divorce at the time. And she also was fascinated by Dark Shadows because it took her out of her space in the world and into this fantastic world. So there's a through line of how people in need of something to connect to and something to focus on zeroed in on that show and it lit a fire absolutely was it was it the phoenix storyline when you started watching it or was it later on no i i actually came in later on uh i was visiting my father and his stepwife uh step my my stepmother his wife yeah. at the time and she was one of those ladies who had a television in every room and starting at about one in the afternoon, she would begin the process of making herself up and dressing for my father for dinner time when he arrived home. And Dark Shadows just happened to be one of those shows that was in the lineup on the TV, and I caught it. And it was one of the vampire strings with Barnabas, very close to when Adam shows up. And I remember being totally fascinated by all of this. What were those bite marks? How did that happen? What what was going on in the show? And eventually I saw Dick Smith's makeup and I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. How do you do transformation on that scale? And at the same time, of course, I had seen Star Trek and Spock's ears. And how do you do that? I was running around the house with scotch tape trying to make pointed ears by wrapping <laughs> scotch tape around it. How do you figure that out? Dark Shadows did the same thing. I was pulling shirt stays out of my father's uh, collars and making fangs on a piece of cardboard to try and emulate what I was seeing on TV. And that started my journey into how to take a person and transform them into something else. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Now, were you also uh, a monster kid? Some, uh, were you into... Uh the famous monsters of Filmland and, and all of those kinds of things as well? You know, at the point that I saw Dark Shadows, I was six or seven, I, I was not. I had not been exposed to any of that. The minute I was, I became, yes, a famous monsters kid. I was definitely into all of the monsters and the monster models and all of that kind of so thing. So Dark Shadows was like your gateway into that? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Unfortunately, my I was raised by my crippled mother on welfare, and mm-hmm. there was no money to go out and buy all the toys and buy all the stuff. So I, I just went into the books. I read everything that I could possibly read. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, it was it was similar for me. Dark Shadow. My uncle introduced me to Dark Shadows, but he was a monster kid. He loved all of that stuff too. Uh-huh. But it was Dark Shadows was the primary focus, and that sort of was the gateway through which I also got into all that other stuff, which he was also telling me about. But Dark Shadow, it was kind of Dark Shadows, and then the gateway in, into that. Um, and also what you said about kind of Dark Shadows appealing to outsiders is something that. I hear over and over again on this podcast, and I've certainly identified with that as well. Um, but it is, it was an escape. And characters who were other on that show were the ones that you followed, you started following their story of Barnabas and Quentin and Angelique and Julie, all of these characters that were outside of the norm. Uh, and that I think that resonated with a lot of people for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And and it's interesting you you mentioned Angelique because most people like myself who are introduced to monster makeups through famous monsters and all the rest of that don't also do beauty makeup. Mm -hmm. And Angelique was a catalyst in that. I found her so stunningly beautiful to look at and and all the other ladies, of course, and the the hypnotic effect that Grayson Hall had on you, that beauty makeup also became a part of what I was doing. And eventually that gave me a career that has been split down the middle all the way. I do both and I am proud to do both. Yeah. And that, and like you said, that is a rarity in the industry, right? You, you, you do both, uh, you handle both sides of that, which is amazing. Um, Can you talk, so you, you got into Dark Shadows, Star Trek, you were growing up with all of these things and trying to figure out how to emulate those things, uh, watching things like Dick Smith's old age Barnabas makeup and being transfixed by that. Um, So how did you finally get into the industry, into the makeup industry? Uh, As I tell students when I'm teaching about makeup, Mm -hmm. everyone has their own path. And it's not going to be the same for anyone. It's not like you're applying for a job as a secretary and you send in a resume and you have an interview, get it or don't. How you get into one of these artistic fields is a wandering path. As it turned out, when I was playing around with the shirt collar stays and mom's eyebrow pencil to draw on the vampire face, we had a next door neighbor who was working in a local amateur theater. And they gave me, she gave me a book on makeup by Leishner Cosmetics, very old fashioned stage makeup book. And so I started to buy actual makeup products and sit there and copy the makeups that I saw in the book. Eventually that grew to more complicated books, more detailed books. And by the time I was 12, I'd say, I was already working in the theater as a makeup artist. Mm -hmm. By the time I was 17, I left home and I ended up at the CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, because I was raised in Vancouver, Canada, Mm -hmm. and working as a makeup artist. That was 1977. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, I mean, I really never did anything else other than makeup. I went into it with a passion and I decided when I went out on my own, that I wouldn't do any work that wasn't related to makeup. So I could sell in department stores, I could sell stage makeup in a store, I could do whatever. And I eventually ended up teaching it as a way to make money as a second career. But I always wanted to stay with the topic of makeup. And subsequently, uh, you started working uh, on, and was it television or film that you got into first? I was at the CBC for a very short time. Oh, so CBC, right. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to remember I was 18. Yeah. And an only child, more or less, my brother is nine years older than me, so he was long gone. Uh, I was a bit arrogant is where I'm coming around to say. (laughs) And they didn't keep me there for very long. I didn't quite fit in. I wanted to learn how to do monsters and learn how to do prosthetics. And they wanted me to do the newscasters and fold towels. And it was kind of a an uneasy fit. Yeah. So then I started working in uh, makeup retail stores, 
that were specifically for film and television and theater. And I eventually got a job at the Blanche McDonald School teaching makeup for their aesthetics program. Mm -hmm. And I approached Blanche and I said, could I create a proper TV film makeup course for you? Which I did, it was 30 classes and they were about two hours each, I think. And over the years that became the Blanche McDonald Makeup School, which is still running. And I am still on their board of directors 35 years later. And uh, it is one of the premier wow. TV film makeup courses in Canada. Wow. Wow. So that was that side. <laughs> yeah. On the other side, there was a union. And I was non-union. And there was so little work coming into Vancouver that there was no way I was ever going to get in. I just sat there doing whatever I could do in the meantime, waiting for my big break. And eventually it came. I got a phone call while I was teaching from uh, a makeup artist coming to town to help Michael Westmore do Plan of the Cave Bear. And they were going to cast local actors and needed dental supplies, plaster, alginate, that kind of thing. And my name was given to them to find those products. And although I couldn't work on the show because it was union, I could assist backhand and that's what I did. I helped with all the casts. I did mold making. I did whatever I could with them. And eventually when it came to do the show, there were four union make makeup artists in Vancouver at the time. They were all women. And the requirements for the movie were to fly 20 minutes in an army helicopter every day up to the top of the glacier and then back down from the glacier. Wow. And the, all four of the girls turned it down which meant it was now open to non-union people. And I was in there like a shot. Yeah. And that's how I got in the union in Vancouver, eventually became chairman of the makeup department of the local. Mm -hmm. And then I left there in 1990 for Los Angeles. Okay. Okay. Wow. Um, one of the makeups I love that you did was uh, you did Meg Foster's makeup in Masters of the Universe, right? Yeah, she looks yeah. amazing. Um, but was that before, were you still in Vancouver? So you were still in Vancouver at that point when you did that? Yeah. And again, this is, this is how careers work. They're back and forth and up and down mm -hmm. and they're little threads and synchronicities. Mm -hmm. I happened to be doing a TV series in Vancouver and I got a call from Mike Westmore. And he said, I have a small movie down here. If you're union, you can't work on a non-union show. Mm -hmm. So I will run it and I'd like you to be the department head. And I turned it down because I had a job and I didn't, I personally don't like leaving one job for another job just because it sounds better. You made a commitment. Yeah. Two weeks later, he called me back and said, I have two movies. I quit the job. I got on a plane and I was there. And I flashed. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one was um, Hoover with Treat Williams, who's okay. just passed away. Yeah. And then the second one was Masters of the Universe. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, although Mike gets all the credit, and so he should, they were his shows. I was the actual on-set department head running the show, putting makeups on, and just dealing with the day-to-day -day running of things. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and I did both prosthetics and beauty, and Meg was one of my characters yeah i've met her several times she's she's fantastic really she's cool. really interesting she's a yeah. very unique person and it was a joy to work on her now you've also uh, as time went on you you've done uh, i think i'm going to call this episode Ma makeup artist to the vampires because you've done so many uh vampire uh makeups from dracula dead and loving it to buffy the vampire slayer to 2004 dark shadows pilot um and in the original show we had some really great vampire makeups i mean it's Barnabas himself, when he was in vampire mode, would often have those like kind of dark around his eyes, the, the black around his eyes and the dark, the pale face and the hollow cheeks, a very classic vampire look. Uh, but you've done a variety of, of vampire looks. So can you talk a little bit about your work on vampires and maybe some of the comparing and contrasting some or, or the trajectory perhaps of working on, on these vampire makeups that you've done? Well, I mean... As we talked from my initial Dark Shadows moment, 
I was fascinated by vampires. I was fascinated by all the monsters, but particularly vampires. And I think that, again, synchronicity is involved. When you're passionate about something, either people know it and recommend you for that kind of work, or it just comes to you because you put it out there so much. Most of these jobs just sort of came to me. Um, Dracula, Dead and Loving It was because I was the second makeup artist on uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights. Oh, yeah. I love that movie. <laughs> I was supposed to be the department head on it, but someone else came in and convinced Mel that they needed the job and I got the second position. Mm -hmm. So when Dracula, Dead and Loving It came up, the producer who had put me in the position to be department head on the one show made sure I was department head on the other. So that's how I got that particular job. And, you know, it, it was great fun. Mel Brooks was one of the most unique people I have ever met. <laughs> I, I, I know that comedians have a reputation for not being funny all the time, if you follow me. Mm -hmm. Mel was a really interesting contradiction in a total understanding of what humor was and the ability to be absolutely humorless in certain situations. Mm -hmm. So that was really fascinating to watch. And, and I'm so happy I worked with him. He was very kind to me. He gave me the uh, dark, the Dracula ring. Oh, the, he did? Oh, that's so and, cool. <laughs> and, and the wig and the, the <laughs> big white hat wig. Um, while I was doing that, I think the next job was the Brady Bunch movies. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And the middle girl. Jan. Think, that, is that Jan? Jan? Jan Brady, yeah. <laughs> the actress playing Jan Brady was auditioning for something to do with vampires. Mm -hmm. And as I found out, it was Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Mm -hmm. So I said to her, can you take a resume in and just plunk it in the pile? I, I know there's nothing much you can do, but just throw it in there on someone's desk and we'll see if anybody calls. And of course, nothing happened. Never heard anything about that again. But a little while later, Tom and Barry Berman, who I had worked with a little bit, called me and said, we are doing this little presentation, which is a partial pilot for a TV series. And we don't want to do the on-set work. Would you be the department head under us? And we'll make the prosthetics and give them to you. And you just run this 10-day job. It turned out to be Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Wow. So I got that job and everybody on the show hated it. I mean, the production company, mm -hmm. the, the crew. They said it was incomprehensible. That was the script <laughs> lady. She said she couldn't read it, didn't understand it, and it would never go anywhere. The director of photography was so disinterested. He would point out a few lights that he wanted and he'd go away. I wouldn't see him for hours. I don't know where he went. It was just one of those things. I remember we were filming something in a classroom with Sarah Michelle Gellar and she's in her dialogue and there's this rip behind us and we all turned around and the first AD who had a newborn baby had pulled her bra off and was feeding the baby in the what? middle of the scene. <laughs> wow. I mean, this was just one of those moments where nobody wanted anything to do with this. Mm -hmm. When it was done, I went to Joss with the hairdresser and I said, I want to be part of this. Mm -hmm. If this takes off, if it goes, please let me work with it and work with you. And, you know, he listened and was very polite and it ended and we walked away thinking we'd never hear about it again. Then I got a phone call. We're mounting Buffy the Vampire Slayer and your name has been given us to be the department head. Yeah. And that's how I got Buffy. Wow. No, and yeah. you did you did the makeup for you were in charge of the entire department. I know you did, I saw some picture Drus, Drusilla's makeup and things like that, that 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 you personally worked on. Um Buffy the Vampire Slayer is one of those shows that has turned into a huge cult hit. Um and it's one of those shows that I always say owes a lot to Dark Shadows, uh, particularly with characters like Angel, who is 
you know, a descendant kind of of Barnabas and characters like Louie and Interview with a Vampire and things like that. Were any of the people involved with Buffy the Vampire Slayer outside of yourself Dark Shadows fans or was Dark Shadows ever talked about on on the set at all? Well, I mean, Joss, of course, knew Dark Shadows. Mm -hmm. um, but I, not to my knowledge did we ever, as a crew or uh, an artistic endeavor, discuss Dark Shadows, except mm -hmm. myself. Of course, I started the show saying, this is as close as I'm ever going to get to Dark Shadows. This is all, yeah. all I've ever wanted is this show. Yeah, And I made that known. And I did at one point uh, end up going to a Dark Shadows convention. And sit, um, I st stood, I did not sit with them, but I stood at a table with a lot of the actors who were having dinner after the show and talked about Buffy. Mm -hmm. and agreed that I would take their resumes and their curriculums and give them to Joss uh -huh. on the off chance that there might be a crossover of some kind, oh, which yeah. I thought would be brilliant. That would have been amazing. Wow. <laughs> Joss was not interested. Oh, really? Oh, that's so disappointing. I actually feel that part of that is probably my fault. I think that People like producers, writers, what we call above the line, don't like it when below the line crew get out of their place. And make and suggestions, think, yeah. Yeah, I think that they felt that I was being too pushy or too whatever at the time. But I was just so excited yeah. that I could facilitate something like that. But no, that didn't happen. Well, that's really great that you attempted to do it um that's a shame that joss whedon was not into that because i think people would have been really uh excited to see something like that i always cool. love it when i mean a crossover would have been incredible i just i love it when references are dropped and, and sure. so or, or they'll bring in an actor to um uh, as a sort of a to reprise the role or to just Sure. As a as a nod to to that, because uh, I think they, it would have been cool. Um, before we get now, you said that was as close as you thought you'd ever get to Dark Shadows. Of course, that isn't the case. You did end up getting much closer to Dark Shadows than that when this WB pilot uh, came around, which sadly never went to series, never never aired. But subsequently, it has showed up. At, they played it at the conventions, and now it's available online. People can watch it on YouTube. Um, how did that come about? Um, and how did you get involved in that? And were you, you must have been really excited, I would imagine, to be part of Dark Shadows officially. Well, yes, indeed. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't for lack of trying. When I arrived in Los Angeles in 1990, they had just finished the 1991 Dark Shadows revival. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know. I was busy in my career, busy doing what I was doing. And I happened to be walking down the lot, not paying attention. And a car almost hit me. And I looked up and as it went by, it had dark shadows in the parking plate. Thing. <laughs> and I was crazy. <laughs> On the set, which they were taking down. And I, I walked into the Collinwood mansion. I'm looking at the portrait of Ben Cross, who I recognized, and said, okay, so he's going to play Barnabas. And I was very excited, knowing that there was a pause between the pilot and picking the show up. I started to call every day. And every day I was told, we don't even have a production manager yet. Call back. When we do, you can talk to him. So finally I called and they said, we'll put you through. And I get the production manager who says, oh, no, we're not interested. We come with our own hair and makeup team. Oh. I never even got an interview. Oh. I never even got a chance to make my case. Oh. So I didn't get that show. And I just wanted to put that as a preface because the next thing I hear is they're doing a pilot. And I hear it on the grapevine. It comes up in the, in the trades. And I started calling called this producer. I called that AD that I knew was connected to this producer. I sent resumes. I sent at least five different resumes at different points into their production office. Nothing. One day I get a phone call from a makeup artist of my acquaintance. He says, guess what show I just got? <laughs> said, they just called me to be the department head on Dark Shadows. And I told them, I can't. Oh, has to be Todd McIntosh. 
And he gave the job to me on the condition I would use him as my second. So that's how I got that job. Wow. And when I was in there talking to the production manager and he's going through my portfolio and seeing all of this stuff and my drawings of Barnabas and I said, how come we didn't hear about you sooner? I, oh. said, well, <laughs> I sent all these resumes in. So let me call my secretary. Yeah, they were on the desk. No one had ever looked at them. Oh, geez. Wow. And that's a, that's a story that I tell, again, students, because it's really important for you to understand it's all networking. Yeah. A resume doesn't mean anything. They don't go onto IMDb to search for a makeup artist for a show. They wait for them to come to them and they pick through the pile and you don't know, or it's recommended and that's how it's done. At any rate, there I was doing the show and the producer and production manager were very happy to have me there because at least I understood the characters. Mm -hmm. And we ended up in a production meeting with the director who was brand new. They had let the other director go and brought this new director in and he knew nothing about Dark Shadows. And the first thing he said to me was, so Angelique, she's a vampire, right? And I said, no, she's a witch. She's the one who puts the curse on Barnes. Okay, so Willie, he's a vampire, right? <laughs> no, Willie's a thrall. He's been bitten and he's in service. I had to explain all of this. And eventually he would say things like, well, we're going to get rid of that cane and we're going to get rid of that ring. Ugh. Nobody wants that. It's all stupid stuff. And it it went uh, down from there. We yeah. struggled. We struggled miserably to try and make something exciting that at every term they would ruin. Mm -hmm. One of the main things that I said at the beginning was that if you take a prosthetic and you light it with amber light, it will turn into cardboard. It'll just go dead flat. So mm -hmm. please don't use amber colored lights on the prosthetics. But the director of photography had decided that he wanted this pilot to look like an Argento film. Yes. Yeah. I noticed that. <laughs> so bright yellow, bright green and bright red lights were everywhere. They wiped out the beauty makeups. They made faces look like wet dishcloths. They, they just ruined anything that I was doing. They may have made a beautiful show. I don't know. I'm not willing to say on that one. But and I get his passion to try and do that. I think there would have been better ways to introduce that. but And the one sequence that was prosthetics, he lit with almost daylight, clear light. Yeah. So, yeah, it doesn't look like cardboard, but it does look like rubber. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, and, and how did Dan Curtis factor into all of this? With this new director coming in and you're saying things like he thought the cane was stupid and the ring. And I've heard this before. And Dan Curtis, who very much would focus on what was done before and wanting to kind of redo that in, in a reimagined way or back like kind of how it was because it was worked the first time. I'm sure that probably did not work for Dan Curtis too, or was he more hands-off with this one? How did that work oh, out? Uh, <laughs> I'm retired now. I can say whatever I want to say. <laughs> Dan Curtis was kept at arm's length. Oh. I was actually told not to talk to him. Really? Wow. He called me and he wanted to know something I was supposed to prevaricate and not tell him and whatever. And they wanted to keep him away. Mainly, I guess one of the struggles was he wanted a more mature cast who yeah. could carry these characters. And they wanted young, young people to carry a new audience. And there was a battle going on between the two. So Dan Curtis really was not allowed. I mean, he could say whatever he wanted to say, but they didn't have to pay attention to it. And uh, I have probably one of my favorite stories as a Dark Shadows fan. I was on set one day and I get a phone call from Dan Curtis's office that he has an actor. He wants to audition tape for Barnabas. And would I come down with some fangs so they could put it on tape right now? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we were in pre-production and I wasn't needed on set. So I drove to the uh, makeup supply store, got those little co coffin fangs. You know, oh, yes. Yep. Anybody. 
drove to Dan's office. I got there early and I sat in a chair and filed those teeth to make them look more realistic. I used um, a product that we used on Buffy, the denture relining material, mm -hmm. and fit them to the actor who was a lovely Australian actor, really liked him. And, you know, we're ready, we're waiting. And suddenly in comes a camera operator with a steady cam strapped to him, followed by Dan Curtis, followed by, oh my God, my brain, who played Hoffman in the 1991. Barbara, Barbara Steele? Steele? Wow. Followed by Barbara Steele, who's going to read Hoffman off camera. Wow. For this. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of standing there blinking. <laughs> We're in Dan Curtis's office. The trilogy of Terror Doll is right up there at the top of the cabinet. Yeah. Barbara's cane is leaning against the wall over there. Wow. Dan Curtis is standing in front of me. <laughs> and he says, okay, we're just going to roll the camera. And I want you, I don't know if he called me makeup. I'm sure he didn't know Todd. I want you makeup to run in and just shove the teeth in. And if they don't work, we'll just keep going. And I said, okay, roll the camera. We're doing this. And I, I guess Dan is known for this, but his impatience with what he's getting started to show through mm -hmm. and stepped behind the cameraman put his arms up against his on the camera and started moving the camera himself <laughs> into the position that he thought it should be in. And in the middle of this, he says, okay, run in and put the teeth in. I ran in, popped them in. And of course they're custom fit for him. No problem. I walk away. And Dan sort of stops and looks at me and, okay, we're going to keep going and <laughs> say the lines of dialogue. And he suddenly says, okay, I want you to run in and put circles around his eyes. Well, he'd never warned me about any of this, but I happened to have products in my bag that I was ready to do that. And I ran in and did that. And again, he just sort of looked at me. Film, film, film. Okay, I want you to run in and make him sweaty. I happened to have Evian in my bag and I ran in and sprayed it. And he looked at me and he said, this is like a real Dan Curtis production. <laughs> I love it. And that was my favorite moment. Because I was prepared and I could do anything that he threw at me at the moment, it was just like he liked to film. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a great story. Thank you for, for sharing that. That's fantastic. The the 2004 pilot, they didn't pick it up. Was it because of all the conflicts happening, like the director not getting it and and all of this kind of thing? Or was it, were there other I, I don't know. I mean, I'm below the line. I do not know what happens above the line. Yeah. All I can tell you is that um, Jim Pearson, who sort mm -hmm. of handled Dark Shadows for Dan Curtis Productions, uh, told me it was unwatchable. Mm -hmm. And I said, I have to see it. I just have to know. Mm -hmm. So he set up for the hair and makeup department to come to Dan Curtis's office and get screened that pilot. It wasn't finished with all of its stuff yet. And we stood there looking at each other going, it's unwatchable. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a mess. Yeah. And that I think is really what it comes down to the product that they turned out as a potential pilot. Couldn't even be saved. You'd have to reshoot the pilot. Mm -hmm. And I think they spent something like $5 million on that. Wow. Pilot. Wow. It's an expensive pilot. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of current shows oh well, this isn't current now it's 2004 but um I, I think sometimes they lack an understanding of of the gothic of gothic horror and, and gothic romance and how that feel uh you know and it i i didn't feel it captured that um yeah. you know uh unfortunately so i i it's but still it's a shame i think it could have developed into its own really unique thing if it had potentially continued on I would say the script was really well written. Mm -hmm. it's, it's unfortunately what they filmed. And it's like the director, I don't know what he was doing, but like, for example, um, Elizabeth has these speeches and yeah. for some of them, they'd be soft and then she'd be yelling yeah. and then soft again. And he was giving her direction to do that. That wasn't the actress's choice. And like when Angelique comes through the, the windshield of the car, and Victoria's faced with this, he wanted them to laugh so that Angelique was laughing 
and then he made Victoria laugh back at her. Yeah, that was weird. It's like, what are you trying to achieve? But that was all the director. Okay. Very and strange choices there. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, and I, I knew that at, at some stage, I, you know, there's enough rumors going on on set. I knew that they were unhappy with what was being turned out. Mm -hmm. But apparently the uh, director and DP that came as a package had an ironclad deal and they couldn't get rid of them. No, that's they simply had to let it play out. Yeah. Although some of the, the best parts of that were things like, um, like the Barnabas makeup uh, when uh, he first um, rises, uh, you know, when the, when the blood drips on him and he, he, he wakes up. Um, that was uh, really uh, the actor who was, it wasn't Alec Newman at first. It was Doug Jones, uh, who was um, he he was the corpse of of Barnabas before he like mummified Barnabas before the drop of blood falls right. on him, and then he wakes up and he regenerates and becomes Alec Newman Barnabas. That was re that was really cool. That was, I think, yeah. one of the highlights of of that pilot. Now, so he did. Were you did you construct um, well, that makeup or design it? As with Buffy, as with all of these shows, I'm an on-set makeup department head. Mm -hmm. That means I get the prosthetics, I put them on and I color them. Gotcha. And I look after them on set, but I don't construct them. I Very see. rare that I've constructed them. So that was um, creative characters, Andrew Clements. And he created all of those uh, monster sculptures and I controlled putting them on. I got him to hire Doug Jones because mm -hmm. Doug had been one of the gentlemen in Buffy. Oh, and yes. I yeah. do it. And I, I had a relationship already with him. And he came in and did that, regardless of the fact that he's super tall. And um, Alec is, is definitely just a few inches taller than me. Mm -hmm. So that was something we were trying to hide. And I don't think they hid it very well. I don't remember who I assigned that makeup to, but I didn't do that one. Mm -hmm. At the time that that one was being done, I was putting the other face on Alec. Okay. So mm -hmm. We were all sort of, it was a, a a day of filming where we were picking up a lot of this kind of green screen and mm -hmm. whatever action. Gotcha. Um, one uh, one of the other like beauty makeups that you did on, on that pilot was um, uh, Marley Shelton's Victoria, who uh, I read an interview with you a while back where you said it was uh, inspired by Tippi Hedren's look in, in The Birds, and that's perfect. It has that exact kind of vibe to it, which I really loved. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I do like to reference things. And, you know, yeah. when I ended up doing Pushing Daisies with uh, uh, Brian Fuller, oh, yeah. we got along so well because his entire way of communicating is referencing movies and, mm -hmm. and looks. Yeah. So we just fit in that way together but yes the, we looked at it uh, when she got that short blonde haircut and that little oval face and I said let's try this and mm -hmm. we were both very happy with it and yeah that look she ended up with yeah it definitely cast against type because Victoria's to traditionally has dark, long dark hair so right. uh, yeah that, that was pretty cool um have you ever thrown a dark shadows reference into your makeups and other projects you've done well, here we go, full circle, back uh -huh. to Dick Smith and yep. the House of Dark Shadows. There's a famous story, which I will be telling when I introduce the movie. Um, Dan Curtis was wanting this to be a very adult version of Dark Shadows. It's going to be very bloody. He wanted more than what he could do on TV. And he said to Dick, I'm tired of these two little dots. I don't want these two little bite marks. Give me the biggest hickey you can give me. Uh -huh. So Dick Smith went back to his lab and he started to sculpt these vampire bites. And it, it was escaping him. He couldn't figure out how to do it. He even took a pair of dentures and pushed them into the clay to try and get that toothy, bitey thing and it wasn't working. So he got frustrated. He went upstairs to where his wife was cooking dinner. And sure enough, she was making veal cutlets. <laughs> he said, don't cook that. <laughs> Grabbed the cutlet, ran downstairs and took a big meaty bite into it. Extended the vampire marks and that became the fang marks, the bite marks that you see, which is literally Dick Smith's dinner. 
Yeah. <laughs> Very gruesome looking too, I might add. <laughs> so I took that idea and they have shown up several times. Mm-hmm. I did bites like that, cutting, biting into meat and making molds on Buffy. I did it on the pilot. And I'm sure I've done it a couple of other places where mm-hmm. vampire bites show up. But you know, that's one of the only things I can think of that's a specific Dark Shadow story that I yeah. injected elsewhere. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great segue because um, on August 17th, 2023, there's going to be this uh, event at the Ted Man Theater uh, with a double bill, uh, The Hunger and House of Dark Shadows. And you're going to be introducing House of Dark Shadows in the focus of your uh, introduction for the film is going to be Dick Smith. So could you talk a little bit about, about that and why um, sure. the introduction will be focused on Dick Smith? Well, the entire uh, run of films is a tribute to Dick Smith. He did okay. The Hunter, he did all of those those movies. So um, it's not like I'm coming in to introduce House of Dark Shadows as much as I am Dick Smith's work on that movie. I see. Okay. So really what's intriguing, and I've already said this a couple of times, is the the twisting of threads through a career and the synchronicities that happened. In 1968, Dick Smith had just finished doing The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for Dan Curtis. And I don't know if you know the full story of that, but there was originally an actor who was hired that Dick did a full makeup on. Jason Robards. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They started filming and Jason was like, go. And that's when Jack Palance came in and his head was the size of a melon, (laughs) a flat plate face. And there was no way anything that Dick had designed for Jason Robards was going to go on uh, Palance. So he redesigned the makeup with the inspiration of this little statue he had found of a satyr. Mm -hmm. And that's where that makeup comes from. And just in my head, I am thinking what an amazing thing Dan Curtis got there. Yeah. Not only Dick Smith's brilliant work, but a redesign and a redesign that is iconic and totally different than any other Hyde makeup ever done. Yes. I can imagine, and I don't know this for a fact, but I can imagine Dan Curtis coming up to Dick on set and saying, "Uh, hey, Dick, we've got this this stupid vampire show on a daytime show I'm doing, and we're going to age into 175. You interested? (laughs) Oh, it's just, he's there. It's convenient. He asks him. What I find uh, also interesting is that Dick Smith never did another makeup for Dark Shadows. He did Old Man Barnabas, and that was it, yeah. That was it. And all of the other makeups were handled by Vincent Lascalzo, the show's staff makeup artist. Yeah. So it makes you wonder why he was never called in for anything else on that show. And it makes perfect sense if you happen to know the weft and weave of what was going on in his career, because he was right in the middle of prepping Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman. So the Barnabas makeup became the test makeup for Little Big Man. That's why he was anxious to do it. And one of the things that he was um, researching and trying to develop was a blinking eyelid. Now, up until this point, if you were doing an aging makeup or anything that involved the upper lid, it was basically a hard piece of rubber and the actor's own lid just blinked underneath it. What Smith was doing was creating a a very thin sculpted piece that would glue under the eyebrow and on the lash line and the middle loose would fold like an accordion with the actor's own eye movements never done before. And he created that for Barnabas and was ready to go there. The other innovation he wanted to do for Little Big Man was a foam latex bald head. And up to this point, bald caps were used and they have no texture or very little. They're basically just a a shower cap without the fluffy fringe (laughs) that gets stretched and glued on and blended. What he wanted to do was absolutely sculpt the skull shape and the wrinkles and all the little imperfections into the foam latex cap. And this would be done in a two piece mold. He later created a way to do it in a one piece mold, but that's further down the line. He made this, he wanted to make this and he presented that to Dan Curtis. And it was felt that 
because Dark Shadows was half an hour and it was shown two days and that was all the Barnabas makeup was working, that if they put this bald head on him, nobody would know who Barnabas was if they'd only just tuned in once. Mm -hmm. So that's when they chose to do the bald cap and the wig with the little white fringe on it. Okay. So, so originally, Steve Smith wanted him to be bald. Interesting. On the show itself. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And there, there's one other thing which, you know, you may have noticed or may not have noticed. It was extremely tight timing. Yeah. So Dick Smith made aging hands for Barnabas, but yeah. didn't have the time to put them on. So he glued them onto rubber gloves. Oh, okay. And mm -hmm. throughout that whole sequence, if he's holding his cane or he goes like this, like he does a couple of times, yeah. you can see the gloves bending at the middle yeah. and the yeah. tips collapsing because obviously it was not the way to properly do it. But who was ever going to think that that show would be watched ever again? <laughs> it was a one-off, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody was going to record them. Mm -hmm. We watch in 2024, still going to be watching them. <laughs> <laughs> so they let things like that go mm -hmm. so off goes dick smith does little big man and dan curtis calls him to do house of dark shadows he's going to reprise the old barnabas makeup this time there is no concern about not knowing who barnabas is so he takes the bald foam head he made for little big man and uses it on frid for the House of Dark Shadows. Yeah. He also didn't like the forehead he'd sculpted in the TV show and sculpted a new one. Mm -hmm. He also used the um, eyelids from Little Big Man, which were now perfected on Frid for the movie. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a hybrid makeup. Yeah. And while a lot of people might not be interested in this, uh, it is, I think, important for people to understand the history of makeup, who are makeup artists, who are fans of Dick Smith, to understand he was working just like any other makeup artist was. You pull a piece of this, you sculpt a bit of that, you struggle with this one and this one's easy. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's important to make him um, more human, I think, because the minute someone becomes idolized to the point Dick Smith was, you tend to think he, he couldn't make any mistakes. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just a, a work in makeup artist like all the rest of us. Yeah. He just happened to be supremely talented. Right, right. Um, that makeup he did for Barnabas, the little big man makeup, possibly the most terrifying uh, image <laughs> in that film. I mean, that's a really uh, frightening vampire makeup. In fact, it was Ben Cooper did the did a mask, uh, I guess, on unlicensed old oh, man vampire yes. mask but it was totally the dick smith barnabas old man um uh, makeup yeah How, did, sure. you did you ever did you know i think dick smith was vindicated by that because mm -hmm. that bald head made that makeup uh inhuman yes yeah it was yeah. the fringed it didn't it didn't do anything frightening for the tv show Right, right. Although the T, I loved the TV show makeup too. I, I thought it was really cool. I mean, when I first saw that as a kid, I was shocked. Uh, it was, oh my God, Barnabas is an old vampire. You know, it just was really cool. Uh, did you ever get to meet Dick Smith in person? Oh yes, for sure. Yeah. I, I yeah. took his um, his course uh -huh. when it was first offered. Ooh, back wow. in 1980, I think that it was a long oh. time back. And uh, we corresponded over the years occasionally. And mm -hmm. when he was in LA and there was any kind of function that I would be invited to. And, you know, I didn't sit and talk to him for hours and hours. Yeah. Uh, and I also went to visit him in New York uh, and got to see the Linda Blair doll in his garage wow. and all wow. of that kind of thing. So I did spend an afternoon with him, but we talked mostly about vitamins. <laughs> vitamins, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was a passion of his. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, how about? Did you ever get to meet Vincent Loscalzo? Did you ever get to meet Vinny at all? No, no, I didn't. And I actually am have had a hard time finding any information out about him. Yeah. Yeah. And I, me too. IMDb. He practically has no resume. Mm -hmm. Now clearly, this man knew what he was doing. Yeah. He could do out of kit makeups like crazy, and he was very proficient, but. I don't know what his history was and I don't know what happened to him. 
Yeah, because he later, he did, as far as I know, he did the old age makeup on Angelique when she was Cassandra. He did the werewolf makeup, which I loved. Uh, the the oh, He did the Frankenstein and the yeah, sure. yeah. Jekyll and Hyde that came up yeah. later and all yeah. those bodies. <laughs> There's a few movies oh, okay. use at the time. So mm -hmm. it, it makes me wonder if he, he uh, um, left the business or unfortunately may have passed away Yeah, yeah. somewhere in there because there's just so little information on him. Right, right, right. Um, I want to ask you before, before we wrap it up, I have a couple of just kind of fun fan questions. But one thing you mentioned was that you grew up in Vancouver and I've had a couple other fans on the show who were uh who did grow up in Canada and were able to watch Dark Shadows there because Dark Shadows was primarily broadcast in the in the US but it did cross the border into Canada so you were you must have been in one of those uh places where the signal was being picked up there sure we were ABC four o'clock channel four mm -hmm. it was pretty standard I think across yeah. most of America yeah yeah uh, yep yeah, exactly because yeah because i know some of the people who are further up like jonathan fred's mother she was in um hamilton ontario i believe and she couldn't catch the show where she was so she came down to new york and he put her up in a hotel so that she could watch <laughs> the show for a couple of days so she could see him on the show because she couldn't watch it up in wow. canada at that time yeah yeah who was your favorite character in the show I mean that it it's so hard because it is tough to pick. We as fans love all of those characters, or, or maybe some of your favorite characters. How's that? Obviously, Jonathan Frid's performance captured my attention. Obviously, Barnabas was a central focus for me. Mm -hmm. I remember trying to build a clay wolf head cane in art class. Oh, a, wow. a wonderful art teacher who tried to help me as best he could. <laughs> You know, I, that was a focus, but certainly um, I would have to say that uh, Grayson Hall, obviously with her wildly idiosyncratic performance, was hypnotizing to watch. Mm -hmm. I loved David Selby. Yeah. And um, of course, um, Laura Parker. Yeah. <laughs> and throughout my career, I have had some high points that way. I managed to make up David Selby on um, Legion. Oh, cool. Character on that. Yeah. Um, he walked into the makeup trailer and the hairdresser took him first. And in their conversation, he said something like, well, I used to be on this little show called Dark Shadows. And she just took the chair and, <laughs> and said, I think someone wants you in the makeup department. <laughs> He's so nice too. He must. He must have. Oh, he was so sweet. Yeah. And I, I had brought his book of poetry with me, and he signed oh. that. So. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I am very good friends with um, Juliet Landau and her husband, Daryl. And they, of course, have been working on vampire-related projects for eons now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the process, they were going to interview Laura Parker. And they asked me if I would come and be the makeup artist for that day's work. Oh, wow. So I made Juliet up and then I made Laura up. And yeah, that was another fulfill the dream moment. Yeah, she's great too. I've had her, I've had both David and Laura on the podcast and it was a pleasure talking to to both of them. Uh, yeah. And in fact, after um, she, she asked me a bunch of questions too, after she, she was ask about my life and and things like that and it was really cool to to get to to chat with her too yeah, yeah. during the uh, the time i was working with her i was able to have lunch with her just in the makeup room she and i chatting so that was nice yeah oh uh, so cool um so uh what about any favorite storylines that jumped to mind uh, from the show before i do that there is one other oh, oh yes cast member that i met oh and yeah had a wonderful moment with and that was john carlin Oh, cool. He visit the 2004 pilot. Did he really? Okay, yeah. And we were chatting and talking and we started to discuss the um, bites on his wrist because they weren't allowed to have a man bite a man on the neck. At the yeah. No. And I brought him into the trailer and I put bite marks on his wrist. Oh, uh, I love that. Show, and he <laughs> wandered around showing them to everybody. So that was a really great moment too. I love that. That's great. I okay. wish 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I he's he was everybody loved John Carl and everybody I've ever talked to that's interacted with him. I met him briefly once at one of the Dark Shadows festivals in New York. Um, and I was kind I he got into the elevator at the same time I did with my late husband. And I was like, oh my God, it's John Carlin. But I was kind of starstruck and he's, he must have noticed because he chuckled. He's like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> he was friendly oh, right away. I was like, hey, hi. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I don't know if you remember, they did a, a Lovecraft inspired storyline on the show, The Leviathans. And they never showed the Leviathan creature. It was some monster that that was, you just hear the breathing. Um. And I like asking artists about what their conception of the Leviathan creature is. Do you have any thoughts about that? Like, how would you envision that monster? Well, I mean, that's a really interesting question. When you've got something like that, I mean, it's 1968 or 69 at that point, and there's no money. You can't build a puppet. You can't build a creature, and you're not going to do... Uh, Velcro suit <laughs> or yes, something like right. that. So I think they handled it in the very best way they could. Mm -hmm. The breathing was scary. The The idea of size that they kept talking about was scary. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one moment, can't remember where it is, but the Leviathan creature has walked through the house and there's like hay marks on the ground. Yeah, I really loved that because it made you go, what is this thing made of? What is it? Are those its footprints? Is it shedding? Did it walk through? What is that? And that kind of questioning left you there. For myself, I mean, I, you're looking at that sculpture through the entire Leviathan section. Yeah. So I am going to assume it's some sort of tentacled or snake-headed creature. Yeah. Um, but even in Lovecraft, he hints at things. He talks about shapes. Sometimes he describes it, but sometimes he just lets yeah. it be. Yeah. And let even the name, the Yog Shoggoth or whatever it is, yeah. give you a visual impression without telling you what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that worked very well. Although I must say, the Leviathan chunk is my least favorite section. Is it really? Yeah. You're, well, you're, a lot of people feel that way. I don't way. like Graham well either. I'm not, I'm not happy with the end of the show. <laughs> right. No, that that one is, I find a little bit boring. Yeah, a lot of fans concur. And and with the Bramwell, the 1841 parallel time, there are some, I love all the Dark Shadows storylines, but, I, and when I first saw the Leviathans as a kid, I was still like, I was definitely all in on that. Well, I think I was a teenager by the time I saw Leviathans. I might have already been in yeah. my teens but i i i dug it um but i i can understand it's such a jarring change from the rest of the series the the tone the whole tone of it and everything um right. but i agree with you i think the fact that they keep showing that serpent headed naga there must be it must somehow resemble that but maybe even more much more horrifying like something we can't comprehend like you said with lovecraft it's only, he drops these hints but you can't the mind can't process fully what it's what it's looking at right. um when i saw the hay on the floor yeah. shaggy came to me so serpenty and shaggy at the yeah. same yeah. yeah 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 um would you i know you're retired now but there are there's a potential new dark shadows series on the horizon I, I mean the strike is going on right now so everything's kind of on hold um but mark b perry has been on this podcast and he's uh really not giving up on this he's he is full steam ahead on doing this dark shadows reincarnation uh, sort of a sequel series to dark shadows uh would you uh come out of retirement if you were asked to be involved in something like that well this is yet another one of those um it's a repeat story for me. Mm -hmm. I heard about it ages back. Yeah. I started phone calls. Oh, I okay. To, I talked to Mr. Pearson. I talked to anybody I could all the way through. And eventually, uh, Devril Weeks, who is Juliet Landau's husband, who is connected to the show in some way, knows the producer and was working with him for another project, 
asked me, I've got a friend whose birthday is coming up. Have you got anything that's really dark shadows, that's unique, that I could give him, I could buy from you and give him as a birthday present? And as it turns out, several of the Dick Smith Barnabas makeup photos, which were his property that he gave me, I had blown up. Oh, wow. And they were framed. And I had two sets. So I said, here's the second set. You can give it to him as a birthday gift. And they're straight from Dick Smith and no one else has them. Wow. Except they, they have been reprinted in magazines by now. But these were original prints from Dick Smith. And it turned out that was the producer for the new Dark Shadow series. It was Mark. Mark B. Perry. Yeah. Wow. So he at least knows who I am. Therefore, <laughs> tried to introduce me, at least subject matter wise to him, but it's so far away from production. Yeah. They don't think about makeup and hair people until they're a week away. Mm -hmm. And then they go, oh, maybe we should hire someone. <laughs> right. It's really yeah. silly the way that works sometimes. However, I had an in and I was waiting and I would call and I would check with Devril and he kept saying, oh, you know, it's so hard to get anybody interested. And it just wouldn't happen. And I had to sit there and say, do I reserve retirement while waiting for this possibility that Dark Shadows might come oh, back? Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Or do I just retire? Because I can't just sit and wait. Yeah. And I had to retire. Right. There was no way around it. I mean, the, the industry, I am 62 Nobody is hiring 62-year-old makeup artists to run departments anymore. Oh, it's just not being done. Hollywood is full of ageism. Always I, I've, yeah, for, yeah, I've always heard that. Hollywood is very ageist, yeah. Um, but, I mean, with your skills and your immense body of work that is, you know, Emmy-winning uh, you know, makeups that you've done, I, and being a Dark Shadows fan, I would hope that they would uh, certainly have you on their radar for when that happens. It would be nice. Uh, I mean, in order to do it, I would have to put on hold both Social Security and my pension, mm -hmm. come out of retirement, rebuild, and get to wherever they're filming, because I live mm -hmm. in Spokane now. Yeah. You know, the fact that you were even considering putting off your retirement specifically because of Dark Shadows says a lot. Yes, yes uh, I was. Yeah. So there there it is. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's let's hope for more good things in the future um, for, for both yourself and Dark Shadows and this really exciting Ted Man Theater uh, event uh, that's going to be coming up on August 17th. If you're in the Los Angeles area, please do uh, go to this event. It sounds like it's going to be uh, really cool. Uh, so, and you get to hear Todd talk about Dick Smith. Um, and you can also check out Todd's website, which is uh, MacintoshMakeup.com, uh, which has lots of great information uh, and images, and uh, definitely check that out. And Todd, I want to thank you for being my guest here at Terror at Collinwood today. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you and hearing from you. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Thank you for asking me. Oh my goodness. It's my absolute pleasure. And thanks again to Steve for connecting us. Uh, and folks, please be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, I'm on up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Stitcher. Well, Stitcher is going away. That's disappearing. iHeartRadio, all, all of the podcast apps. Make sure you rate and review. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. And for as long as they lived, the dark shadows never truly vanished, for there will always be Terror at Collinwood. Terror at Collinwood is a Penny Dreadful production.